how can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually it could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Today I'm gonna to introduce you to Glenn Devitt. He is an army veteran with a background in human intelligence, commonly known as human and counterintelligence. He also spent time working with Homeland Security, specifically in their investigations of computer forensic analysis to help combat child exploitation. As you're gonna to hear today, he left working with the Department of Homeland Security and he founded his own organization. He's the founder and CEO of the Sentinel Foundation. According to deliverfund.org, 15 to 50,000 women and children are forced into sexual slavery in the United States every year. According to the organization Thorn, 150,000 new escort ads are posted online every single day. Traffickers are gonna look for the softest targets. They often target migrants and refugees. For example, 76% of refugees surveyed in the Mediterranean countries said that they had been trafficked or exploited. It's an issue that's all around us. And speaking for myself, it was something that was happening around me nearly every day that I paid no attention to. I mean, this is bittersweet for me because this is like closing a chapter. Because once I tell this story, I can't go back undercover. And so it's like, it's very hard. But I, you know, like I said, I realized you can't rescue yourself out of this business. We have to have the people stand up. You have to have the people to realize that this goes on. And you have to be able to relate to people. Like it has to be able to relate to them. They, they, it's not so far out there they can't touch it. It has to be here, it has yeah. to be close to them, so. What was it that got you over that threshold of being willing to come forward and actually put your face on what you're doing? Man, this fucking work will rip you apart. You know, I've been doing it for, since 2014. And so like, I've been ready to close it like for a long time. Um, just perfect timing, man. It was like, I was just waiting for the right time. It was like, our whole saying was about the deed, not the glory. Don't tell the fucking story, just do the work. And then it got to the point where it's like, we have to tell this story, we have to tell it right. Like, cause I'm surrounded by legends that are doing legendary shit. And so, yeah, you have to give it up and it's addicting, man. It's like fucking crack. When you rescue a kid, you're like, this is what I want to do. Where'd you uh, grow up? Born and raised in Philly. Military family history? My two grandfathers were fucking studs during World War II. One was a POW, sniper, captured, fucking legend. The other one, he was, on the Eastern European front, and then my other grandfather was in uh, the Japanese Okinawa uh, side of things. And so, so you had heard about military service growing up, I'm assuming? Oh, man, dude, from the, I always knew I wanted to be a, something with a gun in my hand. Like, okay. either a cop. So you were hooked early? Oh, dude, from like Cowboys and Indian days. Like, you always were, I don't know, you just, I think you have it in it. And then 9-11 uh, happened my senior year of high school. Next fucking day, I went to the recruiter's office. Was there a line? Dude, it was, yeah, well, in Philly, yeah, it was like, you know, it's such a proud fucking town, and I grew up in a shithole area. <laughs> so it was like military was a lot, either military, construction, firefighter, or police, pretty much like where I come from, a blue, blue collar area. And my mom was like, no, I'm not signing. So I was like, okay, well, the day I graduated, I fucking signed a line. I live in Bravo, infantry. Uh, but I agreed to go off to college. I had like a bullshit scholarship. And I was doing the SMP program. So simultaneously, like you, your National Guard, infantry, and then you're going to be an officer, then to go to active duty. Is that the, uh, what it, was it a weekend, a month, two weeks, a year? Yeah, it was fucking like, we got activation orders, and I was like, I'm going to fucking die. Like, we had all fraternity <laughs> brothers, and then it was like, dudes in their 60s. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, they're like, you're like, this guy's going to be fucking killed. And I, I always knew I wanted to go active duty, and then I didn't really care to be an officer. Like, I, and like, Afghanistan had happened, right? And then Iraq kicked off and I was like, I'm gonna fucking miss war. And it was like, and I wanted to be enlisted. I knew I wanted to be on the ground doing this shit. So I was like, fuck it. I like, one day I woke up in college and I just withdrew from all my classes, went to the recruiter, I was like, get me active duty. And so I went, go active duty as Lone Bravo. I wanted to have a ranger contract. They're like, no, you're going to Fort Riley, Kansas. As a city boy, I was like, fuck that. I was like, what are your options? They're like, or you can reclass into counterintelligence. And I was like, the fuck is counterintelligence? And so they kind of walked it through me. It was that one of those, those breaking points where they go active duty as 
you know, infantry or counter intel. So I went the counter intel side and I knew I wanted to get over to the special operations community at some point. So I did the, the counterintelligence side and then I got stuck back with an infantry unit in Hawaii, like just bet it back as like a tactical, it was awesome. It was like worked out, you know, great because, you know, we were a tactical human team and I got embedded with an infantry unit. Then I did a 15 month deployment in um, Baghdad. We were in the battle for Sadr City, which was a fucking 2008 March. Yeah. It was absolute mayhem for, we were supposed to be there for four days and we were there for like 36. It was fucking nuts. Um, so I realized like then I was like, this is kind of what I want to do. Um, and then I got recruited by the unit um, to go there. I went to West Virginia and I got my dick crushed. Like I was like fighting mixed martial arts and jujitsu. And I was like, I didn't fucking train at all. I was like, I can just fucking do this. And so I was, the, and I was Intel. So like Intel dude going to operator selection. Like I showed up with my fucking green duffel bag with two pair of boots and my fucking base uniform. And there's dudes like with two rolly bags with protein and everything. I was like, I fucked up. You know, like. Cadre's just probably looking at you like. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, regular army. <laughs> they're like, Intel dude, they're like going through it. And there's not a lot of us that's been through that. And I was like, I was the same class as Goggins. Okay. In 2010. And the only got, difference is you graduated. Was, well, I got, I got Intel. Yeah. When I went through, right? And so, yeah, exactly. We, we got crushed. And so they were like, got to like two days before the, you know, the end one. They were like, hey, do you want to go fucking Intel? Uh, we'd love to have you, you know, be humaner. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be fucking human. I'm like, do you want to go to the farm? All these things. And I was like, yeah, this is fucking like a dream. You know, I get kind of best of both worlds. What did you like about the counter intel human occupation? Man, the psychology. Just learning about people? Like that and like the manipulation and the mindset to go into it of like how to get somebody to risk their life, you know, to um, do what you need them to do. Do they have a structured like quite uh academic approach to that and how they teach that or is it broad concept you you go through some schools like the reed institute like teaching about interrogations and like the mindsets behind that and then you do a lot of like practical exercises and i, I taught recruitment after iraq and everything like that i was teaching like how to recruit people um and it, it's not bad but you don't you don't get good at it until you start doing it you know until you start doing source operations and social a lot of it's social engineering Right? Finding everything about you and then me being who you need me to be to then get you to do what I need you to do type thing. Once you get a handle on that, how easy is it to kind of steer people around like a vessel? You're good. The hard part is just shutting it off when you're not working. <laughs> right? Like, that is like, you're going through like the manipulation side of like, how do you shut this off? Like, am I doing the job? And when I did it, I did it for like 11 years. And so it becomes natural. That, that was in the military. Then yeah. I did it while doing the child rescue side, where it's like, then it's like full blown. You know, you're hanging out with traffickers trying to get them to you know, do what you need them to do and you be who you need them to be. And, you know. Yeah. Looking back on it, is it, uh, is it easier to manip uh, manipulate or drive or coerce, coerce people than you would have initially thought? It is, especially if you use the cyber side. Like, especially if I like stalk your background, I know everything about you and then. Then you take that with a full plan and go into it. It's not that hard. It's not. Were it you looking crazy. at trafficking at all at that point in your life? Had it hit your no. radar at all? Man, I got medically retired. So after I left there, I was teaching them at SWIC, and uh, I didn't realize that the chiropractor was like doing everything, like and annotating everything. And so you're classified, and then you become unclassified. And I got fucking medboarded because I had like seven, eight bulging discs in my neck and back, and they were like, like unwillingly, you got medboarded. They were like, this is during the Obama era, and they're like downsizing. They saw my shit, so I failed a flight physical, and they're like, hey, go to the ortho. Ortho saw it, he's like, yeah, you're, we're not going to approve your flight. So I was like, ah, like, do I stay in? And, you know, like, fuck, I mean, I talked and felt I was in good shape, but she's obviously neck and back. It's just from jumping and all the other bullshit. Yeah. Your static line's the worst thing ever. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I was like, all right, fuck it. So I, like, I was kind of like, what do I do with my life? And I literally just was like, man, war's so gray, you know, like, you know, with Iraq and everything like that, losing all the buddies that we lost. And then I was like, ah, it's just so fucking great. I was like, I want something that's very black and white. And I was like, what's more black and white than helping kids? And I know I had a skill set that could do good, but like, I didn't want to go contract. I didn't want to go, you know, go fight that again. So I was like, I oh, just child, Google child rescue. And like literally got in front of a computer just and just Google child rescue. I was like child rescue. There was like one nonprofit that popped up and they had just started too. And so reached out to them to get shit. And so then, um, SOCOM had a program for former special operations operators into support guys where they would then 
teach you computer forensics. And, and I, at, that, at this point in time, I started getting into hacking, like just self-teaching myself. Yeah, just in your off time. It was like more, I had like a three hour class when I was at that organization. It was like, I could break the internet for free and like get shit for free. So I was like fucking busting paywalls and like stealing stuff legally. They left the door open and I would go through it. So it was at that point in time. So I was like, ah, I, I don't know if those two words go together. Was actually that? stealing and legally? It's true, but it was, so it wasn't, I was borrowing. <laughs> it was borrowing. Did you ever return the things? No. Okay, but, okay yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I mean, hacking's very gray and everything like that. And so, and I've done forensics on cell phones. I was being Intel, like, yeah. So I've been doing that from five. So I had a program where you could actually get certified. Um, but they would teach you like the mindset behind pedophiles like for four weeks. And then you go through your forensic training for eight weeks. So it's called a hero core, human exploitation rescue operative. What, and what department runs that? So Homeland Security okay. was SOCOM. It was, now it's open to anybody. Um, and but was, they had a di uh, direct bridge between the two? They had to connect it to it. So like SOCOM Care Coalition is like a program for people getting out. Yep. And the, so they like, were like, hey, you should apply for this. Um, I did, and I was selected, and I got the call, and so then I had like a contract gig set up, or I had that, and it's like, this, the, the thing, the catch about this is it's, un, it, in the first, where, since it was class two, it was unfucking paid right? Like, so you're going unpaid now, so you're leaving the military, yep. you're going unpaid for a fucking year, for, and then obviously you know how the VA works, the benefits, and I got medically retired, but it takes a while for it, so I was like, man, this transition period is going to be fucking hard. I called her up. She got home. I was like, man, sorry. I just, I can't take it financially. I'm like, I don't think I can bridge the gap. And I, the second I hung up, I knew I fucked up. I literally, thank God it wasn't from a, I called her right back immediately. It was like, I, I take it back. I think I'll be, I'll be there. You know, like, I'll fuck it. It was like, you know, when you know you fucked up. Yeah. And I was like, I called her back immediately. I was like, okay, that was, that was a sign for it. And so went through, man. And then man, like the first four, three, four weeks were nuts. Cause they have you in this child advocacy center where you have all these kids that are walking around that have been abused and they're going through their forensic interviews and they're like, it's fucking nuts. So you see all these kids uh, and then they start coming in and they start telling you, showing you case studies of like things. And then they start talking about the psychology behind these people and like the damage that goes to an infant showing the brain waves that change the baby. And like, it really just took me of like, this is our future generations and they're under, they're under attack. Did you that know? just knock you on your ass when you started getting exposed to that stuff? Yeah, it, oh man, it's so emotional and so fucking hard. Like it was, you know, because I think we're very passionate people. Like when we hook in this up, and so we're hooked in fully. Well, especially with kids too. Because oh. like, I don't know about you, another one of the characteristics that I have found with our backgrounds is a disdain for bullies. Oh. It just, just a disdain for people being picked on and the yep. willingness to step in, whether you're going to win, lose, or draw, but step Fuck in it. between yeah. the adversary and the person who's being bullied. I mean, I can't think, it's a, it's a, you know, clunky and painting with a broom a little bit metaphor, but k kids have control over almost nothing. They're innocent. They're innocent and they can't protect themselves. They're Helpless. not equipped mentally, emotionally, or physically to, to protect themselves. So yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, one, that it knocked you on your ass or two, that people from our background sometimes are uh, gravitated towards that direction. Yeah. You know, you just, you're helping the helpless. It's our motto my, my, in the foundation we have. It's just helping the ones that are helpless. How was it when they started uh, breaking down the psychological profile of the predators? Well, you know, like, I mean, because of working human intelligence, like, it, like, psychology is everything. And you're going through it and you're just like, man, these people are fucking everywhere. They're, it's... So when you say that, like, break that down for me. Like, when you... <sighs> man, if, if you look at the amount of images that of, these are children being raped, right, that are happening, the, the amount of downloads of people in the U.S., there's more downloads in like a year of time then we have more people in the u.s but in context like i don't know if it's like 339 million don't quote me on that but it's fucking nuts like when when i was at homeland security like we'd go and we have this certain software and be like these are all the people we can have that are actively five to 20 years in jail just for the images they have on their computer and like there's thousands of them in your city you're like, you can actively, and you look at people like, well, oh, they're just downloading, you know, it's called child sexual abuse material, CSAM right now. It used to be called child pornography, and then they changed the name for it. And like the amount of people that are downloading, you're like, fuck. And every one of them could be arrested. Every one of them could be f minimum five years in jail. Depending just on the for state. possession of the images? Just for possession. And these are fucking some of the worst shit you've ever seen in your fucking life. And like they have one, of, and so if you look at it, and the best way of saying it's like if I'm watching porn and I'm watching blondes, 
everything like that. I'm gonna go out to the bar. What's, I'm probably my preference is blondes and I'm eventually gonna step that boundary. Eventually you'll try and you'll get that. And with pedophiles, they, they embed themselves around children. You know, like you'll see like certain companies or nonprofits and they're like, they're there because that's what they're doing. They're doing psychology, like learning the psychology behind them and then understanding how they manipulate. They groom these children. You know, they're, they are sometimes your relatives. They are like, it's not stranger danger for the most part. So yeah, you have like, when I was, when we going through that, it's the psychology was insane. Just to see the effects on the children when I was like, fuck man, we have to do something. And so then, then you go through your forensic schools and then that's like, I'll never forget the day. Uh, there's this guy, Jim Cole, he's a fucking legend and Homeland Security, and he was, he was the one teaching the class, he was the first one that showed me actually, like it's, they were like, hey, they're gonna show you now a child that's been raped, is being raped. And so you have to sit there and like you watch physical it. physical act, you have to sit there and watch it. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to it. The fucking sounds just fucking destroy you. And right there I was just like, like I mean if you could just fucking like a nuke going off my body where I was like, I'm gonna fucking, I wanna murder this individual. You're like, well, obviously you can't, you have to, you know, like what my, my foundation is we are fine fixed asset for law enforcement, right? They have the job to do the thing. And at this point in time, I was like, no, now I'm going to be a forensics. I'm going to be doing the job. And they showed me that and, I'll, and I won't ever forget it. Cause I was like, Phew. and then after you graduate from that, man, they gave us this little award and the, one of those kids that were in that center, they had a little handprint and it was saying like, thanks, you know, you know, thank you, you know, for what you're doing. And like, we have this, on my wall, I have this little handprint, this little kid. And I know that that kid was abused. So it's like that motivation that you have. Yeah, it's a fucking dark, dark world. But then, yeah, you, uh, you start doing this job, man. And then like every fucking day you're working in these cases. I'm talking like sometimes 25 fucking terabytes of fucking child images. And you have to go through, they have great tools out there that do a better job if like it's duplicated, then it hashed through through the technology that they have, and you don't have to watch it, but there's so many, you have to, if it's, the video changes a little bit, you have to watch it. You how have to are, go through where the homemade shit. How are they monitoring the people who they are tasking to watch this stuff? Like the moral they injury and burden of somebody being forced to watch what you're describing, like that, that's gonna leave far more than a fingerprint on you. Are they keeping tabs on the people that they are teaching to do this job? No, like if you're working in the forensic side or if you're like, they're like, oh, you can get off and you can work white collar. Like, no, the fuck you can't. No, you can't. Like, you, you can, all, all this is child crimes. Really, like, it, there is some fucking white collar. Like, oh, you can do that. Like, no, you can't. Because there's so few working in the forensic side. There's so, nobody wants to do this job. And the ones that are sacrificing are the ones that are stepping into the fire. Like, these law enforcement, like the ICAC, which is like in most states, like, they do such a great job. The Internet Crimes Against Children. Yeah, like, they, they're great great organization that do a lot of funding for it. So they take brother girl cops and do it. But looking like, like I'm sure in this town, like there's probably like one to fucking three dudes or girl, men or women, I say dudes, but working this, they, they probably don't have the forensic training, right? So they're not fully caught up on it. You know, they, they're, they're in it and they'll do it for a little bit, but then eventually like, it takes a fucking lot, like just to keep doing this in and out every fucking day. And these law enforcement are rescuing in their neighborhood and they're fucking where they live. <laughs> you know, and they're seeing all this stuff. And yeah, it's a, it's a special breed, but they, they don't, they say that, yeah, you can get off it, but you can't. Like they offered me, at the end of my program, they're like, they offered me a, a direct hire to an 18, to a, to a special agent. Like I was, I was fucking killing it. And they were like, hey, special agent, well, usually you're supposed to go in to be a computer forensic analyst. But then they were like, because I was like, I don't want to, I want to be a fucking agent. So they're like, yeah, well, actually from DC was like, yeah, we'll make you a fucking direct hire special agent. I was like, Obviously, that takes time, and I, I spent three months out of it. And I was just like, I can't. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and actually, the HSI agents, their Homeland Security investigation, hands down, I will say, is probably one of the best in child crimes. It's like the best kept secret in the US government of all the child crime cases that they work. And a lot of the agents are like, Glenn, go fucking go hunt. You know what I mean? Like, go do, go do your thing, man. They're like, you would, you'll be able to do so much more outside the government than with the government. Um, and is they, that what got you to leave? I was transitioning out, and I was from that time you have that gap between they were like, you can be a special agent, can it? Because that's always I wanted to do. I was like, I just want to fucking hunt these guys. And so I was like, all right, I'll go out. And then I found that original nonprofit I applied for. They came back during that time. And we're like, hey, we want to work together with my for profit enterprise. Uh, so I had like a cyber, I got into hacking, I actually got really good at hacking. So I was teaching at Black Hats, which is like a, a top hacking course. 
during that period of time while I was doing forensic, I was also learning hacking and going through it. Um, so then I was training government agencies while then I had a contract with this nonprofit. And then that first year in 2016, I think it was, I worked undercover in six plus countries. But like at first I was just a cyber guy. And I realized quickly that I'm working with a fucking bunch of amateurs. And they were great people, man. They, had, they were in the fight. But from the organizations that we come from, I'm like, there's some top talent out there yeah. that are not in this fight. And the first year I was like, this is fucking suspect. Like I'm in Haiti, like working. I'm like, these dudes, I'm gonna get fucking killed if I keep this mentality. So I was like, I gotta be able to recruit guys from my past organization to come into the fight. Um, and so, yeah, after that first year, then I was like, I wanna start my own nonprofit. I was like, I hate nonprofits, so let me start one. You know, like I hated it, the way they were raising money. I hated like how they were showing all their tactics. I was like, I want a nonprofit like our organizations, like, like a tier one unit where we don't talk about it. We're not there, you know, um, we're just there just doing the job and giving all the credit to law enforcement uh, for it. And so that's kind of how my foundation started. I called my, uh, my work wife, Jameson. He is like, we're yin and yang. I'm fucking controlled chaos and he is like very much order. He's a former Green Beret. Um, we, we met together teaching surveillance and so we just fucking connect it. And so we do everything together. For-profit companies, nonprofits. It's like, he's like a brother from another mother. Um, for it, I was like, hey, I want to do this. But I was like, I fucking suck at like organizational and I'm pretty much unemployable. <laughs> like I'm like, I'm good at what I know I'm good at. And so came together and we started our foundation. We're like, we don't know how we're going to do this. Um, we didn't know shit about nonprofit work, like of like structure. And we put it together. From it. What year did you guys form it? So we, we applied so in 16, but it took us like eight months, I think, to get approval. Because yeah, the 501c3 pipeline is not quick. No, it's not, well, especially, like, especially with the work we were trying to do and like how we had it written off of like doing child rescue. And it's more of like the way we do it is you have to train them. That's the biggest thing. I wanted to take a tier one capability and bring it to a child crimes fight, right? And so training law enforcement, then assisting on cases, and then working undercover. Right, like if you go to any country in South America or in Thailand, they, they, law enforcement cannot play undercover because all the tourists are the ones raping the kids. That makes sense, I hadn't thought about it. You know, like, see, so they need gringos. To, and like, I have guys that are hmm. in their 70s that like 31 plus years at the fucking agency, all the way down to guys that have never worked in the military. You know, like you have that huge balance of it. And so, you know, like, because even like a, sh a shooter from a tier one organization, like the reason why they work well is because it's not, we're not shooting anybody. We're not kicking in fucking doors. No, it's just that it, there is no no in that organization. Like where you come from, like you just get the fucking job done. Yeah. Right. And so every one of us, and we had a, we have a core team of like five of us. And then we have like a Rolodex, like 25 you bring in. And like that core team of five of us is every one of us can do each other's jobs, but then we can also like, we're usually an expert on a few of the things and kind of balance each other. How do you prep the people that you're bringing into this to what they're about to be exposed to? I tell them, I was like, it will be the hardest thing you've ever done. And like these guys have everything from like fucking eight to 17 deployments, you know, at like at your yeah. level. And I was like, this will probably be one of the hardest things you've done is because you can't kill anybody. You have to stay within law, right? You are a fine fixed asset. You are beholden to the government you're working with. Um, but I was like, it will be the most rewarding thing you've ever fucking done. I will promise you that. The second you fucking pull a kid out and they start crying and then you start crying, like, you know what I mean? Like that, yeah, there's nothing, yeah, there's nothing better. And there's nothing greater you could do. If you were like, and there's, there is some risk, but like, we don't have guns, you know what I mean? Like we got a knife here and there, but you like, you have to worry about criminal elements, but like, God forbid something happened. How, how rewarding is that for your kids to know that you're helping other kids? I was like, so it will be the most rewarding fucking thing you've ever done. I feel like though, it might be one of the most frustrating things they've ever tried to do as well. I tell them that all the time. You're like, why can't we just kill this guy? I'm like, no, we can't kill anybody. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we wouldn't, you don't cross that path, but like they like problem solved, you know? Like, I'm like, it's not solved, right? Like, and I think that's one of the reasons, like I said, I'm here today is because we can't rescue our way out of this, you know, like, we, we, uh, rescuing is so important as you're pulling the kid and it's a sexy thing that goes into it. Taking out a trafficker, force multiplying because right then you, you take down the network, another guy's gonna pop back up for sure. Um, 
But yeah, it's 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 it is super frustrating. Like you like dealing with law enforcement. It's like the Bangladesh side of rescue. We talk about that. Like you're dealing with corrupt, you know, law enforcement. You're dealing with shit situations, re refugees, and like you see, like fucking when you're that poor and that low, like parents selling their kids into it, and then you're trying to there make a difference. But you have to you have to try to create. And our one of our main focuses is create fear, right? With fear comes change. And so that is it's what we try to do. You know, you, you try to make as much fear as you can. And how do you, how do you make fear? Well, if they know they can be arrested, right? If they know potentially that John is actually an agent, right? There's fear, right? The rescuing of the children, right? Like goes into it, but then changing laws. Like we go into some places and we have to learn the laws of that whole region, right? And you find out like how the tourists, how the people abusing the children are manipulating the law. And then we have to try to change that law, right? What kind of differences do you see between overseas and the uh, United States? Man, uh, the, like trafficking exists in everything, everywhere you go. Um, trafficking is more in your face when you go to these third world countries where you can actually like see young girls and um, for it, but in the U.S., it's the amount of child crimes and consumption. U.S. is one of the largest consumption of child sexual abuse material, CSAM, right? Like, they're consuming it, they're doing it. Kids are being raped on a daily, you know, they, I think it's, there's so many different aspects of children, right? Whether it's the trafficking, whether it's the abuse of them. Um, and, and it's just so fucking underfunded everywhere. Like, you know, I, I listen to one of your podcasts, Nick, actually, he quoted, like, I quote, use this quote all the time. It's like, in the child crimes fight in the U.S., do you know who the leading agency is? Child crimes and trafficking, like, pretty much, but child crimes, you know, like. No. It's a fucking nonprofit. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is a nonprofit. And it's a great nonprofit. I fucking love that organization. But it's a nonprofit that is the ultimate, like, law enforcement basically have to reach up to them and they control all the information about child crimes and they pass it down. Why the fuck do we have a DEA, right? We're still focused on the war on fucking drugs, but do you know why, right? It's because asset seizures. When you have a drug case, you seize the house, you seize the fucking car, you seize everything. You get all that money for your overtime budget. Yeah, it goes, right? a, lot, a lot of time goes back. Whereas the a child crimes case, guess what? You can't take the house because the child's there. So then you have this, like, why aren't we spending more money? Like we just sent another 500 million to Ukraine and like, I'm not getting in that conflict, but we sent 500 million there. Could you imagine what $500 million would do in the US for fighting child crimes? Like I was in North Carolina and like, I had an office there at one point and I had like a targeting center where law enforcement could just like reach out to me around the world if like need, need help cyber, we had a team doing it. And I had North Carolina, everybody but the FBI there. And there was like 13 agents, like SBI, HSI, locals, everything like that. It's like 13 people. Like when I was at HSI Charlotte, we had 13 people working in MS-13. Like, like where the fuck is the priority at? You know, there's, yeah. there's nobody that is like fucking championing it in politics. There's nobody that's like, I'm gonna die on this sword. Why do you change. think that is? I think what it is, it, it boils down to is it's fucking tough. Like people are like great at just putting these blinders on. We're like, I, it's not affecting me. I don't wanna know about it. Like that doesn't exist out there because it will, it will ruin you. So, so many people are so afraid to step into that fire and they just don't prioritize it or they don't fully know until it happens to them, until they know somebody and then they get involved in it and then they know. Yeah, and then the blinders get ripped off and you can't help but see you it. You can't help it, but see it. So, it's a motherfucker. But it, like, like I said, it's why I agreed to come on to this, this podcast. This is like, we have to get out there. We have to bring awareness. We have to do it in a way where people can consume it. What's the hardest thing you've had to deal with? The mental health, you know what I mean? Like, that's the fucking, that, that is the hardest thing. It's like keeping it the fucking together, right? Like, a, a nice, the moth to the flame, right? It's eventually when you deal with that much darkness, it consumes you, right? And it, it's really hard to make sure you stay on that side of good, right? And um, yeah, it's, it's a pound of flesh. When you do this work, you're giving up a fucking pound of flesh. There's, there's no, you leave a little bit of yourself behind every fucking time. And like going back from like working undercover 
And then going back and being a father, right? Like, like you're going back between like, because you to do a rescue and to work undercover, you have to act like them. You have to drink with traffickers. You're, oh, you're reading through all the shit on the internet of like how they operate, how they talk, how they you know work. It's so like it fucking consumes you, and that's like you change these identities. But I guess working intel what really helped me was like you are split personalities. You know, like you or you have to be able to balance it. So I think that's one of the hardest parts is the mental health, like keeping it the fucking together. Help me paint a picture for people either watching or listening of how bad it can get. For? How deep and dark can the environment that you are working in get? Like, what's the worst that you've seen? Man. It was Thailand, 2016. Mm, I was working with another nonprofit at the time, and the team leader was there, and I was just starting out with this undercover shit. And I was like, all right, he's like, I have my girlfriend's in town, so he's like, I'm gonna go spend time with her. But I was like, I'm in fucking Thailand, I'm away from my fucking kids, I'm like, I'm gonna work. And I went out by myself, uh, and I started looking at them as like little peddling trafficking kids, uh, like uh, little, the begging kids for it. And I was like, just a little young girl working that. And I was like, you know, I'm just gonna fucking act like I'm drunk. And I went to 7 Eleven, and it's like 2 a.m. I was like, fucking, someone around, sure shit, taxi pulls up. He's like, yeah, I'll take you somewhere. And like, kind of long story short, he takes me to one place, and I'm not young enough. It's like, you're not going in, like, ah, I wanna rape a kid. You know what I mean? Like, you have to, you know, work it. And I was like, finally, he's like at 3 a.m. It'd be a little on the nose. Exactly. Yeah. And like, to get the fucking point. Um, and then he takes me like 10 minutes outside Bangkok, then it's 20 minutes outside Bangkok. And then all of a sudden, like, he takes me to this place. And it's like a fucking steakhouse. I'm like, the fuck is this? And like, there's the little lights on and it's like, I don't know if he's fucking triad or something comes fucking walking out. And he's a pretty big dude. And, uh, and he's fully tatted up. He's with black pants, black jeans, black boots. And I'm like, okay, I'm just kind of getting serious. You know, like, it takes me inside and like, and the, the corner is like these three ladies in like these nice outfits and they're like counting money under the table. It's like something out of a fucking movie. And then like a Papa San comes down, like versus like a Mama San, like a guy's running it. So he takes me upstairs and there's some young girls, but they're Asians. Like, it, like, you, like it's tough. Cause I'm like, I don't know, like 12 to 15 I'm seeing. And I see a young girl with braces and I was like, yeah, I'll take that one. And they're like, all right, we'll take you back to your hotel room. I was like, no, like, do you have anywhere I can go? And they're like, oh yeah, we have a place for you. And so then they takes me to get escorted by the dude and the girl. And they take me to like this fucking carport. And he's these big metal doors and this door opens up and it's a fucking sex room. Like four, and then they threw some condoms in and shut the door. And I'm like, oh shit, like this escalated quickly. And, uh, and I'm just collecting intel. So I started talking to her and we're using my phone. You don't know if you're being monitored or like that. So we're just laying in bed, like sitting there and we're texting back and forth. And she's like, yeah, they kidnapped me from fucking Cambodia. You know, like they fucking, she showed me her tattoo, kind of told her story just back to translation. I was like, like, I'll be there tomorrow. Like, I will come back. She's like, no, you won't. It's like, everyone says that and like, nobody does. And I'm like, no, I will be here, I promise. I give my word. And then uh, pass the information and then nothing was done. And so like rescuing kids, the ones you leave behind are the fucking hardest ones. You know, that's the ones that fucking, that really fuck you up. How many situations like the one that you just described do you think are happening every single day? Of the girls being trafficked and kidnapped mm -hmm. and like just wait. even like just that the sex dungeon like i'm as I'm, it, exi I'm it exists out there you know and usually what those places are, are local spots you know it's usually like the local fucking spots and there's uh it's the people in that country that are doing it and um but like the thai the royal thai police are fucking phenomenal like they care they do a great fucking job you know, this, that wasn't their fault. This was the nonprofit's fault I was working with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they didn't fucking pass the information like they were supposed to. And so, yeah, the dudes, they, they exist. They're out there, man. There's kids in cages. When I was in Bangladesh doing that, like, those girls were being held in cages. You know, like, it's fucking, it's, it's out there. It exists. Have you ever heard of anything like that here in the U.S.? You hear about it, you know, but, like, from the trafficking I've worked in the U.S., like, with law enforcement, it's more just right in your face. Like it's, you know, like they get these girls hooked on drugs. You know, then they put them out there, they do it, then they take all their money from them. And so, yeah, it's, it exists. But I just, you know, the cages side and things like that, it's, 
when you in the U.S. like yeah, like it does exist, but I just don't know. You know, yeah. fully like law enforcement do a great job with those like severe things. Like they they do a great job at that um, of working it. But when you go into third world countries, like they're just overloaded. Like the amount of trafficking, and like, no. Oh. If that was uh, on the lower end of the spectrum, or as you know, as as bad as it can get, what's been the most rewarding thing you've encountered? I would probably say the Bangladesh rescue. So that's a kind of funny how it started. Um, so I had worked this case um, with a team from DARPA, worst pedophile in UK history. You know, five years he was wanted. Um, Homeland Security brought me in, and then three months later he was captured. We don't know what we did or what we provided. If we had something, we just provided information, he was captured. But I had worked with this team from DARPA. They were working on a special project. Pretty sure our project name's classified, but it doesn't matter. So they call me up and they're like, hey, um, BBC World News, we found some stuff in the dark web. They want to see if somebody could go on the ground and bang it. They're like, we can't tell you where it is. Just fly up to DC. Uh, it's like, I'm going up there on a Friday. Well, that Thursday, like, um, I got like an entrepreneur because of the for-profit side of things, a word, and the organization's like, hey, could you take this fucking couple out there in town? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll take them out, show them Charlotte. Well, we go out there, this like woman gets like sexually assaulted, so the guy's about to get in a fight. And so I'm breaking it up, and this dude just fucking literally goes down the pipe and fucking blasts me in the face. I'm like, why the fuck did you just punch me you know, for it. So now I have this fucking massive shiner. Like, fuck it. <laughs> Next day I'm flying to fucking to meet up the right to DARPA thing. fucking headquarters. And like, I have this fucking, the meet BBC World News. And I got this fucking now massive. I mean, my face is like purple. And you know what I mean? Like, but he punched like a bitch. So it was like, um, I'm like, fuck. So they go out. They show, like, so I walk in the room and I got this fucking, this shiner. I'm like, I, I just, and they want me to go undercover. I'm like, maybe I fit the part now. Um, for it, and so then they show me the shit he says online. It was talk, this guy was talking about like, hey, just don't have sex with kids, bring your own kid home. This is how you get your kid from a refugee camp and bring them back to the US. And he gave a very detailed rat line. And they're going through and they're like, where is this information posted? This is like on the dark web. This is, uh, this is the program that they did, they were doing a good job. I'll just say, I'll leave that okay. out. I don't want to give too much of their tactics. So we had it, this, now this mess stuff wasn't supposed to be saved, but we had it saved. And so they're like, hey, do you want to go to Bangladesh? And like at that point in time, they could, they could have said North Korea. And like, I'm going to go. 100%. Because I'll fucking, I have this black eye. <laughs> they fucking flew all the way out there. And they, uh, they're like, Bangladesh. And they're like, all right, fucking, like, what? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm going to go as a singleton by, with, with what BBC represented. So they, they put me on a J visa. And like when they said Bangladesh, I was like, I don't even know where fuck Bangladesh is. You know, I'm like, you think I would have done a little bit more research before agreeing to this? And it's a million Muslim refugees. They're there that are, um, they're saying being trafficked from a refugee camp. So I'm like, let's go. I'm like, and so they're like, all right, two weeks. Let's, let's do this. And so I went, went there with the BBC. They, they put me as a journalist. So Bangladesh police don't know. Like their government doesn't know that I'm working undercover. U.S. government, I'm not really talking or dealing with them because it didn't matter. Uh, I told the RSO that I was in country. And yeah, we just started walking through the camps. Like, fine in. And so I was wanted to try to see is like, there's two ways to look at it. Like, can I watch them do it? Like, trafficking. And, like, the first day I realized it's a complete shit show. Like, it's just fucking mayhem. We're just walking through these refugee camps, you know. Um, and for, and you, you see poverty at a whole different level when you've been to a refugee camp, especially that one. Yeah. And, yeah, so we did, we did that. Uh, within a few days, it was like, okay, we were able to, we interviewed two girls. So Sam interviewed the two girls, found out how they were being, how they were trafficked. And they were young. They were like 13 to 15 year old girls. Um, and they usually have like a three month time or window. So they get raped and abused in three months in these hotel rooms and they get brought back or killed. And so it wasn't too hard. We had a fixer and then find us a trafficker that could get us girls and Worked it, so I had to collect all this information, right? And then I went to all the law enforcement agency, uh, police stations around there, and I asked them, like, hey, show me all the traffickers you arrested. We're doing a story. And then, like, they're all the girls were, like, 12 to 15 that were being arrested, you know? So it's an Islamic country. We're dealing with a huge refugee crisis. Um, and, yeah, it was like, damn, okay, this is a fucking tough situation. I had to have a really locked solid case. So then I'm dealing with the trafficker and everything like that. And I'm through my fixer, I'm getting information. And I was able to have him do a certain technique where I save the XF data and metadata from a picture that I could forensically prove that these girls are actually in 
his control. Because the worst thing, I, I could go in any fucking country and I could give $2,000 to any fucking taxi cab driver and they'll get me a fucking kid. Now, whether that fucking child's traffic, you know, you don't know. So you have to play this thing between curating and demand and actually like in control, but you can do that through digital means. And so I had this exit data and I could have had, if he had these location services turned on, I could have had it lat long, 10 digit grid exactly where these girls are being held. Um, and so that goes down. So we get the whole fucking case and then we go to the, the police, we show them what they have and they're like, no, we're not doing it. We're like, okay, well, then we had to go up to DACA and finally, so like eight days pass, like doing all this shit. And then finally, um, they're like, okay, we'll do it. So I have like this hotel room set up like fucking Chris Hansen to catch a predator. You know what I mean? Like Trevor's going to go through security and like he'll be patted down and like take all the risk out of it. Yeah. Have law enforcement there. And then law enforcement comes up to like, we can't do this. That's one of our sources. I was like, <laughs> motherfuckers. <laughs> so like, no, like we're fucking doing it. You just set it on camera, dickhead. You know what I mean? Like you're doing this fucking operation. So like I got to piss him out. He's like, fine, fine, we'll do it. Trafficker calls me back like 10 minutes later. He's like, yeah, I'm not coming there. I'll meet you out front. So now I'm like, damn, I'm being set up. <laughs> and he like, how's this fucking working? Um, so we go, I'm like, fuck it. We'll, I'll do it on the beach. So me and my interp go down there. And like, they send a fucking scout out, a recon dude. And like, I see a red hoodie. And I'm all mic'd up and all camera. Like, this is all, this is all recorded and on YouTube. And sure as shit, that red hoodie, I'm like, yo, eight o'clock red hoodie is coming up. And this is kind of like, where we have the biggest threat we have is because we have money on us, criminal enterprises, you know what I mean? I'm staged out front. Like that's kind of where the risk comes. For the most part, this is, if you do it right, you, you mitigate a lot of the risk. So sure shit, that red hoodie dude that I'm like, comes up, he's like, hey, come with me up there. And it's like all dark, I'm like, fuck that, I'm not going. And so then the driver brings the girls down, pull the girls out and like, it just works smoothly. You know what I mean? So like between that 10 minutes window, you had setting up like eight police officers in the crowd, getting everything and it kind of all worked fucking out. Uh, for it and so and this was the uk guy what's that no this was um this was this was to prove that girls are being trafficked from the Rohingya refugee camp okay this is the first rescue of like an american buying children from a refugee camp um for it and so that was to make a statement and create the fear that like hey you know this is happening so it's like from the internet to there yeah I mean, if you think about it, a refugee camp with all that chaos would be the perfect place to do it in plain sight. They, they people embed themselves in these nonprofits. You know what I mean? Like this guy gave the recipe online of like, this is how you do it. And we had to try to see if it's possible. And it was, I was able to buy my own kid, you know, for the night. So there was two of them we pulled out. It was a 15 year old and a 21 year old. And the 15 year old was in tears when I first grabbed her, you know what I mean? Up in the room and everything like that. But then the 21 year old was like, something's up. And then the 50 year old one kind of changed all of a sudden. She wasn't as happy. You know, we're eating lunch, and eat dinner and everything like that. And then the 21 year old's texting her phone. So we grab her phone, look at it, and sure shit, she was a trafficker herself. Really? Mm -hmm. So then we had to get her fucking arrested. And uh, yeah, she was like kicking out the windshield, like the fucking BBC's van. And we're like calling the cops to get them back down here. Yeah, she was a fucking bitch. Yeah. What does life look like for the kids that you rescue? So you can't do anything. You can't do a single rescue without aftercare. There's so many great nonprofits out there that take these women and children, young boys, um, and then they give them a new life. And so we, uh, we usually find in a country, we find that, that nonprofit that's doing that type of work. And we partner with them beforehand. You know what I mean? Because you just don't want to throw them back into shit. You want to try to give them a new life. Yeah. What is it that you think that uh, if you're a king for a day and you could grab people's attention for whatever amount of attention span people have at this point in time. Right. What would you tell them to get them to pay more attention, to get them involved more? Stop making fucking excuses. You can help out. You can be a part of this, you know? Like, your life is crazy. It is busy. But you can get involved in any way. Like, great, there's, there's, you, there's the rescue side of things. There's either financially giving to nonprofits. There's a lot of great nonprofits out there in the U.S. Like, call them up and volunteer. Just be a part of it. Like, bull your way. That's what I did. I, like, literally was like, whatever. I'll sweep fucking floors. I'll get my, once I got my fucking foot in the door, then I kicked the door. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you can just slowly get in. You can build it. In a relatively short period of time. And I'm gonna, I promise you, it would be the most rewarding thing. You know, it's helping a child out. In any way. You know, in any way you can do it. Do you believe it's a solvable problem? I, I think if the people, if the people stood up, and the people actually want it changed, then change happens, you know? 
So this is going to come from a politician. You know, it's going to take the people say we had enough. And that's where things change. That's where you say that this is what I want to do. More money needs to go into rescuing children. More money needs to go into um, to these agencies that are helping these children. Because look, after a, a child is abused, like what do they do for society? They're fucking damaged. Yeah. You know, the, the, we've shown that. Yeah, they can, they can come better. They can start to do better. But in reality, we know that all the mental health issues that they go through now from that, like, like it's so much is done to that. And we have to, I think, as for me, we don't do a lot of human trafficking side of things. We do a lot of child trafficking is, or child crimes is because like, I think a lot of the women and, and men that are in that trafficking world that are older, they're hooked on drugs, most likely were raped as a child. They've come from a broken home. They, they were abused. And so getting to the root of it. Talking with uh, Nick and Kara about the trafficking, they said that the most difficult ones are the ones that started off on the abuse side. And for whatever, I mean, I don't have a great understanding of psychology, but for whatever reason, something snapped or broke or realigned, and then they went from being abused to the abuser and were somehow able to justify that in their head which is uh, something I still can't wrap my, my own personal thoughts around, but they are the ones that they described as being absolutely the most vicious and actually the hardest to catch. They, uh, they are. You see that more often than not, right? That they were abused at some point in time and the psychology behind it that goes into it because it's not just the rape that happens. It's not like a one-time thing. It's a grooming of these children. Your young son, daughter, like, they're groomed and manipulated to be someone that they love and appreciative, and then they rape them. And they, they usually consent to it, but you can't consent if you're a child. Yeah, I agree with that. You know sure. what I mean? And so, yeah, it's fucking crazy. But I'll tell you what, though, like, why the fuck is it only if you rape a child, whatever, you know, 10 fucking 20 years, whatever, it should be life in prison. You just ruined their life. You know, like, why aren't more governors saying, you know, what? I'm, I'm fucking, I'm putting my foot down here. You know, if you have this personally, fucking, I think it should go beyond life in prison, but I, I'm not a politician, I would, I would nor do I intend to run for office, nor do I think that would be a uh, campaign slogan that I think would catch on. But I mean, I would run on. I would run, <laughs> I would run for governor of North Carolina. And be like that sentence, you know, like I, I don't if you can prove without a doubt that you raped a child. Yeah. You ruined their fucking life. You took their life and their innocence. Why should you fucking be allowed in the streets? If you can prove without a reasonable doubt, why should you be able to walk the street? Which is crazy part in these child uh, material, if they haven't had a full hands-on experience, these child crimes, they walk the street for the fucking next year until the forensics is done. So, really? Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. It's fucking crazy. Now imagine that these individuals are now facing as a chomo, and child molester, they call them in prison, right? Five to 20 years in jail. And then there's a good chance that they're still walking the streets while all their forensics being done. If the judge sees them not as a threat, it's on the judge's hand. Yeah. Right? Sees them not as a threat. And some judges, they're like, uh, it doesn't matter that he had innocent, you know, child being raped material, or, you know, like, he's like, he's fine. He's only going to get a few years. And he just, they walk the fucking streets, you know, as a registered sex offender. What should parents be on the lookout for? Be careful who you trust, because we know that it happens from people you know, right? Talk to your children. Don't be afraid to have the tough conversations. You know, like I do, like that case in the UK, this individual was manipulating them, getting them to do images, acting as somebody, and he had four girls try killing himself and he kept on going, right? He would manipulate like a fucking evil, mine was his fucking name, sadistic dude, right? And if any one of those girls would have just had somebody for the parents to talk to him and tell them, like I, I tell my daughters, they're never too young. Like say, like be front, like, hey, my daughter wants Snapchat right now. And I'm like, you're 13. You know, like you have to understand, like my fear is not to keep you limited from it. My fear is like, I've read every fucking email. I read these girls saying that they had no help and they were afraid and this guy was blackmailed. And if they didn't, if he, they did not do what he said, he would email and sex the parents, the images, the family. Like the most sadistic fucking things out there. These people exist and are they're around us. You can look up this case. Yeah. It's fucking tragic. What percentage of this recruiting is happening just through the devices we carry in our uh, pockets it's, it's all everything. day? Uh, it's so many. So many children are being manipulated. What do you wish people knew that you think they are unaware of about what you do? Hmm. 
It's a good question. You know, just help out, you know, like be aware that this is everywhere. You know, it will get real if it happens to you. And you hope to, when I was going through friends at school, like turns out like my ex's like good friend's husband was then arrested for child material. And my kids were at his house at one point. While I'm going through this fucking friends at school, I'm about to like have a, like lose my fucking mind. And I was like, Jesus, hopefully like they weren't abused. Hopefully they weren't one of the victims. And it's like, when it gets real, when it starts touching you, you're close to home, then you're like, I want to do something about it. And so I think it's don't wait until then, you know, like get involved in any which way you can. Maybe some younger generations get into the law enforcement side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Where, if people are interested in what we've been talking about, where can they find you? Where can they help what you have going on? Uh, foundationsentinel.org is our website. They're going to info at foundationsentinel.org if they have questions. It's a mailbox to get involved. There's organizations like Operation Light Shine that are here in the U.S. Um, you know, the Tim Tebow Foundation, like he does, their, that organization does amazing work. With us. So we have some partners in here that work in the U.S. We do a lot of international, but um, yeah, like there's, you tell us where you want to get involved at, like we'll gladly try to help you. Yeah. What do you want to close with? Uh, it's one I just, I appreciate you having me on here. You know, I think, like we said, like we're not going to rescue our way out of this. I think that the people need to stand up. Uh, they need to get involved. They have to talk to their politicians. You know, I think we need an administration in the U.S. that focuses on children's safety, you know, real children's safety. Why are we spending so much money internationally when we're not taking care of our own front? You know, 500 mil or whatever we could put into this fight uh, is needed. Yeah. How's your faith in humanity? Man. Are you a glass uh, half full or a glass half empty guy? Oh, half, half full for sure, man. I Even got, after everything you've been exposed to? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like I, I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Um, eventually, it could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. You know? Well, it starts with them being aware of what the problem is. Correct. Yeah. Uniting, standing up. Um, coming together to, to really make a difference. You know, I think we have to change the laws in the U.S. We have to change the funding for this fight. You know, internationally, like, helping out these countries or are, there are, it's an onslaught of like people from the U.S. traveling, people from Europe traveling these foreign countries and raping these children. And then they're coming back and you're in the society here. <laughs> you know, you don't think that they're going to do it here. They just don't have the opportunity. It's not as easy. Well, I think in addition to changing the funding and changing the laws, we have to change the way that we talk about it. And by that, I mean, it needs to be elevated in the conversation and not forgotten about. I mean, again, going all the way back to what we talked about in the beginning, kids are helpless. Yeah. You know, it, it, like they're not emotionally equipped, mentally equipped, physically equipped, and they're the most vulnerable people we have in our society. And they're also the next generations. Like, why would we not make them the absolute pinnacle of what it is that we're paying attention to? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you, you know, for it. So I would say one last you know, thing is just like, give a shout out to, you know, there's, there's not one person in this fight. Like, I'm surrounded by a whole bunch of legends. I think some of the guys and girls in our, from our community need to do more. You know, they, they can take those skill sets from war and the experience we have as wars are dying down and getting in this fight. Yeah. Reach out. We need more people in the fight. There's a time shelf of how long people can do this work. And so... Um, I think some of that is built around the fact they just don't know. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I had no... Like we were talking about before we started recording... In my conversations with Deliver Fund, they, you know, I assumed that trafficking, when the term trafficking was used, was sexual in nature only. And th there is a large portion of that. Yeah. I didn't realize, um, you know, unskilled laborers, even skilled laborers, there is the sexual aspect to it. But, you know, they were giving me examples from hotel cleaning, like any, any type where there's a, a, a go-between that is controlling a large group of people or manipulating them in some way underneath. I had no idea that the problem was as big as it was. And growing up in California where I did, I probably saw it every single day and it was invisible. I didn't start paying attention to it and I'm ashamed to admit this until much later in life because I just didn't know. And I think that's probably the case with a lot of the people that we used to work with mm -hmm. and for. I mean, think about how good they are at their job. If you can give them the two Fs, right? The fine fix, they live to finish. 
So it's, you're gonna have to get over that hurdle, like take it easy, buddy. Yeah. You know, leave the gun in the safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, exactly. I have another target for you that you can be honestly probably more passionate about than some of the ideological people that we were going over or going after overseas. Yeah, I, I agree. There's so many people that have so many skill sets they've learned from the government and getting into this work and like, like we said, you don't have to be poor to do nonprofit work. Like you can still do this work. You, you're not too busy, right? It's just time management. If you're gonna do this and start getting involved and then eventually you could be a full-time position, you know? I think awareness is a huge uh, component of it. So thank you for taking the time to come out, man. Dude, thank you so much for having me out here. So. Yeah, right on. I hope everybody enjoyed the episode. If you wanna learn more about Glenn and his organization, please visit the Sentinel Foundation website, which is foundationsentinel.org. If you want to expand your knowledge base beyond that, please check out the following organizations. These are just a few among many. Operation Lightshine.org, the Tim Tebow Foundation, timtebowfoundation.org. And there is, of course, the National Sex Offender Registry, which you can be found at www.nsopw.gov. Most importantly, and probably the most impactful thing that you can do is talk to your kids and educate them about the threats and danger that could potentially be around them at all times. See you guys next episode. something you dream about. All right, action.